Email remains one of the most exploited attack vectors in the cyber threat landscape, with 91% of all cyber attacks beginning with a phishing email. It's very easy to forge a sender address. I can use your address, Michelle, for example, and send it to your colleagues. Joining me today is an expert in email security who started his career as an electronics technician and developed no spam proxy from a master thesis into a market-ready email solution. You always need a plan B. Hello and welcome to Trusted Talk. I'm your host, Michelle Davidson, and today we're tackling a topic that affects every inbox and every organization, email security. Email remains one of the most exploited attack vectors in the cyber threat landscape, with 91% of all cyber attacks beginning with a phishing email. From deceptive links to spoofed senders, the risks are real and evolving fast. In this episode, we'll explore the shifting terrain of email security from foundational protocols to the role of API connectors. We'll also unpack the most common mistakes businesses make, discuss encryption strategies, and bust a few myths along the way. Joining me today is an expert in email security who started his career as an electronics technician and developed no spam proxy from a master thesis into a market-ready email solution. Welcome to the podcast, Stefan Sink. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Okay, let's dive straight in. When it comes to email security, one of the most important things to understand is that threats often succeed not because of the attacks, uh, not because the attacks are sophisticated, but because organizations make avoidable mistakes. Stefan, what are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen companies make when it comes to email security and how can they avoid them? Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I have um, yeah, I, I have three three topics in mind. First of all, uh, is the uh, close the gap. Um, nobody's perfect, and therefore uh, there's not not a hundred percent detection rate possible in in any solution. So uh, there's always a little gap, and you have to to deal with it. Uh, and the most uh, the, the 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 email itself is not um, the the attack vector itself it's uh, an url a link inside the email or the attachment and so you have to you, you need to have a strategy how to deal and how to check uh, urls and attachments in a more deep way and uh, yeah this is something you have to consider um, you always need a plan b um, for for example if you um, if an, um, malware comes via an attachment uh, one possible strategy might be to um, to change the documents format uh, to take f maybe uh, a word document and uh, put it into a pdf and send this to the recipient then he has the ability to check what's in the document is it important for him or her or not and uh, in the meantime the gateway can check if the word document is really malware free or not uh, if there's a malware and we detect it maybe a second or a minute later then we can delete it from the gateway but the user hasn't received it so this is one possible strategy to deal with these uh, with these small and tiny gaps which are present Another thing is uh, to provide um, yeah, ch uh, reputation checks like SBF Kim Daymark that makes it very easy for any recipient of my emails to check if the email has been sent by me or not. Uh, you must know that it's quite easy, it's very easy actually, to, um, to send an email with any kind of email address you would like to. And um, yeah, this makes it necessarily uh, to... Uh, to Intrude um, and uh, to to include these SPF DKIM DMAX checks, as I said, so that the uh, recipient of my emails uh, can be sure that the email is really is, has been sent by me. The third one is to maybe establish uh, an email firewall. This is how we call it. Um, every firewall technician. Um, uh, sets up a rule set and allows the only the ports he want he would like to use and all other ports are denied so it's very hard to get through a firewall actually and then but nobody unfortunately does that in when it comes to email attachments so everybody is running an email security gateways maybe um uh, he says okay uh, i i don't allow macros in emails and i don't allow uh, maybe exe files in emails but uh, vice versa is, from, from my perspective, the better way. Just allow emails with attachments that you know and that you really need for your business. And uh, this might be another point uh, our customers should consider. 
Let's talk a little bit about baseline requirements. So these are minimum standards every organization should have in place to protect their email systems, but they're often misunderstood or overlooked. So how do they impact email authentication, encryption and compliance? And why do businesses really need to take these seriously? Uh, Well, there are quite uh, some requirements coming from the outside. Uh, for for example, in Germany, the um, Bureau for for uh, is, uh, which is responsible for internet security uh, has some requirements in place. So every company here in Germany is able to read through them and uh, so that they all know um, what what is the bare minimum to have in place or when it comes to um, you know, to a really good email security? And uh, the thing is, uh, as you have already mentioned, email is a big threat vector. Uh, and why is it like this? Because as an as an um, aggressor, I can reach my my opponent directly via an email. I don't have to hack anything. I don't have to hack a firewall, a VPN, or something else. I just send an email, and I'm in the inbox. Uh, of of the of the victim, so uh, this is why I think these baseline requirements are very necessary, and uh, they have to be taken seriously because email is such a, uh, a threatened uh, vector. And that's probably why that statistic that I mentioned at the beginning, ninety one percent of you know, is so high. That's a staggering number of cyber attacks coming from email. Yeah, for years now. For you know, decades, nearly. <laughs> yeah. We've touched on the some protocols already. I'd like to talk about um, three in particular, three pillars of email trust, if you like, which is DMARC, SPF, and DKIM. What are they, and why are they so important when it comes to email security? They are important because, as I already said, uh, it's very easy to to forge an, an, a sender address. I can use your address, Michelle, for example, and send it to your colleagues, and your colleagues will think uh, the email uh, comes from maybe Andreas or something, uh, someone else. So, uh, as the owner of a domain like uh, nosmanproxy.com, for example, I'm responsible to uh, publish the the email service uh, which I have in place, so that every everyone in the world can check. Uh, if the uh, the IP address who is just sending me an email uh, uh, with nosmanproxy.com in the sender address is allowed to do this, uh, and on top, DKIM is uh, is a mechanism uh, to avoid uh, that an attacker can change the content of an email. So uh, this this is um, very important when it comes to uh, when it comes to money things. Uh, if they are uh, like bills on on emails and and other things. Uh, then I would like to make sure that the email uh, has the the right content I sent and this content has not been altered by any opponent. And DMARC is a standard uh, which tells the world, okay, if you receive an email from nosmanproxy.com, you have to make uh, an SPF check, you have to make a DKIN check, and if both fails, then uh, reject the email. That's the best case. Um, as an uh, owner of a DMARC record, you can choose whether nothing should happen if both tests fails. Uh, the recipient can put it into a quarantine or reject the email. The, le- the latter one is, from my perspective, the best one because the email um, yeah, is obviously forged. The sender uh, is not correct. He's not allowed to send the email with this sender address. And therefore, I don't ha- want to have it in my network. And the best thing is to reject it. And how is the adoption, like what is the adoption rate for these protocols? Is it lagging at the moment, would you say? At the moment, fortunately, it's rising <laughs> because of Microsoft, Google, and uh, other big uh, vendors in the in the market, um, like Microsoft and Google. They only accept emails if the sender has SPF and DKIM in place. So you need to be authenticated when you want to send an email to uh, for, for uh, to a Microsoft uh, mailbox, for example. Uh, if you don't provide SPF or DKIM, then they won't uh, accept your email. So um, and this is something I don't want to. So uh, Microsoft, Google, uh, they they help us to to spread the word, and that uh, companies are forced uh, to implement SPF, DKIM, and uh, in, in in the last consequence also DMARC. And it does help businesses get their emails to their customers because without some of these in place, they're just falling into the filters and not hitting the people's inbox that they want to hit. Exactly. 
especially for marketing and sales guys, this is really important. <laughs> I can echo that one. Let's shift gears and talk about something that's becoming increasingly important in email security, API connectors. How do API connectors enhance email security? And can you share some examples of how they're being used within those platforms that you've mentioned? Well, usually the APIs are used by technologies like uh, email security technologies. Um, by the way, Nosmo Proxy does not use the APIs to mailbox providers as we uh, strongly rely to you know, the, the technical standards. They can change from, from week to week. And uh, this is why we don't use the API connector. But on the other hand, it helps to be more synchronous with the with the mailbox provider. It's uh, way more faster, and uh, yeah, usually there's a, uh, some some sort of documentation, uh, and uh, yeah, I can rely uh, on onto this documentation. But every um, provider like Microsoft, like Google, they use different APIs. So for for us as a third party vendor, uh, we must uh, stick to these different standards, uh, and uh, we have to develop our software according to each and other uh, window, which makes it um, quite quite tough from time to time. Uh, but as we said uh, on the email trust way uh, um, on on the email thing, we don't use the APIs, but we are using APIs uh, for connections like like global sign to receive certificates. <clears throat> this this is quite a common standard, and most CIs uh, use uh, similar API calls, <clears throat> which makes it easy for us to receive certificates and provide them yeah just in time for our customers. And there are benefits to using those things for real-time threat detection, policy enforcement, things like that. So it's, again, adding that extra layer of security into your email. Indeed, yeah. Uh, we also we not only provide the, the gateway itself, we also have a cloud-based um, threat detection system we call 32 Guards. And of course, all the gateways out there um, for running on our customer side, they rely on AP, API calls to our uh, cloud-based service so that the email, which is uh, just been received, um, can be checked uh, yeah, synchronously uh, in time while receiving the email. And so we can detect new malware really, really fast. Okay, you've touched on it. Let's talk encryption. It's one of those topics that can sound super technical, and it can be, but at the end of the day, it's really about keeping emails private and protected. Gateway encryption and client-based encryption, what's the difference and why should a companies choose one over the other? Yeah. First of all, from, from my perspective, encryption is, is not the, the big thing because uh, to understand uh, if you don't, uh, as long as you don't uh, want to understand how the algorithm is, is working, then it's quite easy from my perspective. Uh, the difference between gateway and client based encryption is the, uh, the store. Uh, the stop you know, the point where you store the the certificates your private keys the most important thing when it comes to email security uh, and email encryption um on a gateway based encryption uh, the gateway like nosburn proxy hosts the certificates for all the users in the company all the users they 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 don't get in touch with their own certificate but they can be sure that as uh, when it comes to an email uh, and to an outbound email, the gateway makes sure that the email um, gets an SMIME signature. Uh, this SMIME signature uh, gives the receiver of the email the opportunity to check if the email has really been sent by Michelle or Stefan uh, based on the so-called SMIME standard. SMIME is a standard now for nearly 30 years, I guess, even older maybe. Uh, so it's quite common. And uh, yeah, it's relying on a cryptographic um, algorithm, uh, which is secure. And uh, if you do it on a client-based encryption, then the certificate has to be stored on each and every device where the user is working from. So if I want to send an email uh, with an SMIME signature from my notebook, I need the certificate on the notebook. If I want to send it here from my cell phone, I need the certificate on the cell phone as well, which makes it quite complex uh, for the administrator uh, when, it, uh, yeah, when it comes to managing all the certificates. And it gets even more complex when you add that layer of bring your own device policies and when Ooh, people yeah. are using their own devices for emails. That's that could be a challenge. 
Yes, that's a nice word for it. And is gateway encryption better for compliance driven industries? How do, uh, kind of which one is preferred for different use cases? In most use cases, the gateway based um, thing is is the is, is enough. Uh, let's say it like this. Um, of course, there are some uh, requirements. Maybe when it uh, for, for when it comes to health data or something else, then there might be uh, the client based encryption be better. Uh, but this u- usually only affects a few of my um, guys in the company. Uh, maybe if I ha- have a doctor in place or something like that, then client-based encryption makes sense. But in all other cases, uh, when it uh, when we're sending emails for sales, for marketing, these support emails, a gateway-based encryption is uh, is enough. All right, it's time for our myth buster. This is where we tackle a common misconception in the world of digital trust and security. Stefan, what's the one myth you hear all the time when it comes to email security? Mm, yeah, one thing is uh, the one that we just talked about, when it uh, that email encryption is a complex thing. It can be, uh, to be honest, but it must not be uh, if you have the right solution like Nosman Proxy in place, because we are taking care of all this certificate management uh, yeah, by using, for example, Global Sign as a uh, trusted CA uh, to get certificates from. And administrators, uh, they only have to set up Nosman Proxy once, do a few clicks, and uh, that's basically it. And then all certificates came automatically in these uh, in, in in the gateway like Nosman Proxy, and administrators don't have to care about all the certificate management because we do it for them. So if you're looking to embed encryption into your email security, reach out to find the right provider to support you through that journey. Exactly. Yeah. Before we let you go, that we always end our episodes with a fun question. What's the one piece of tech you couldn't live without and why? I have two, and they're not really related to IT. <laughs> uh, there's uh, one thing, which is uh, my uh, amplifier for my bass guitar, of course. I can't live without it. <laughs> and uh, my Garmin, uh, as I'm doing lots of sports. Currently, I'm not wearing it because it's loading. <laughs> but without my Garmin, I won't go anywhere. Yeah. That's all we have time for today. Thank you to everyone who tuned in and thank you, Stefan, for joining us on the podcast. This has been Trusted Talk. Until next time. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into Trusted Talk, the digital certificate and identity security podcast. Today's episode wasn't just about information. It was about arming you with the knowledge to make critical security decisions immediately. If this episode gave you practical takeaways, don't wait. Subscribe to Trusted Talk on your favorite podcast platform and consider leaving a review to help other security professionals discover these essential insights. For even more urgent resources, like regulatory updates and automation tools, head over to globalsign.com. Join us next time as we tackle another pressing topic in digital identity and crypto agility. Until then, stay proactive, stay secure, and thank you for listening.